want to build our lives on God's love, his foundation, and we want to lift him high this morning.
All right, you may be seated. Lord, I pray that you'll just bless our time tonight as we look into your word, as we start the book of Colossians, that you'll guide and direct myself as I teach, and you would work through me so that it would be clear and understandable, and it would be, Lord, living and active and sharp as a two-edged sword, stirring our hearts, motivating us, and uh, just causing us to grow in our walk with you, and, Lord, motivating us to bear more fruit. Thank you for your word and the instructions that you give us, and just bless our time now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So when I'm uh, visiting with somebody and we're talking about their life, whatever their situation is, uh, I've found that often uh, problems come from just wrong priorities and wrong use of time. And so I'll take a piece of paper and I'll just draw a circle in it. Then I'll draw another one inside that circle and another one and another one. So it looks like a, a target. And then I'll hand it to the person and say, would you write what you value in the sense of priorities uh, in your life, put the most important thing in the bullseye, next thing in the next circle, all the way out to the outer circle. There's room to put six, about six things there. And so they think about it and write that in there. And then my question is, all right, now this is what you said was first and uh, last. So uh, thinking about those for a second uh, and the way you live your life in the sense of your time, uh, does that correspond accurately to what you've written down there as what is true in your head in the sense of what's most important, second, third, fourth, fifth? Is the way you live your life, uh, would I be able to observe that and see that that's true? Most of the time, they... Uh, uh, the use of time is actually flip-flopped. They spend most of the time doing which is on the outside, the least amount of time which is doing in the inside. And that's kind of the way we are as people. We uh, don't really control our time in regards to what's most important. And it's often the problem in marriages and with kids and, and even people in church because their priorities are upside down to where they know they ought to be. And so if we were to look at God's word and say, what with God, as he writes in the word, what would we say if we were to fill in that same target with his priorities? First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. And if we did that, uh, I would suggest to you that right in the center of the circle will be the church. The church, that is the highest priority on everything that he has done. And you've heard me say this before, but I'll say it again. Uh, some things are just worth repeating all the time. And that is that the statement that God the Father makes in Genesis when he said, it's not good for the man to be alone, I'll create a helpmate suitable for him. The statement he makes to Adam was, also, uh, was a prophetic statement that he was making in regards to his son Jesus. Adam was a foretype of Jesus Christ. And so when he says to Adam, I will create a helpmate suitable for you, he was saying the same thing for his son Jesus. And so beginning with Genesis chapter 1 all the way through the Bible, the core of everything that God did was preparing a, a companion for his son that was worthy of him, which is the bride of Christ, the church. And so everything revolves around that. And we get the coolest blessing, and that through all these thousands of years as God has worked towards this goal, we live today where we get to be part of the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. And someday we will be the ones sitting at the right hand of Jesus, ruling and reigning with him, his eternal companion as the bride. So let me read to you Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. We're starting on Colossians. If you didn't pick that up from my prayer, we finished with Philippians. And I'll, I'll be on this section here for a couple of weeks. Um, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. So he's writing to the church at Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, 
because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world also. It is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. So this is the church at Colossae, and Paul says a lot there, and I can say we'll be on it for several weeks. So in your notes, number one, the church is the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, and God's goal is to make her beautiful for Jesus. Is to make her beautiful for Jesus. You know, one of the things that used to bug me to death is I spent all those years, all that time raising my kids and they got to be 20. I mean, the hours and the time and the energy and the emotion and the money. Oh. And then some dude comes along and wants to marry one of them. And I don't know him from Adam. And he thinks he's got some rights. And when I tell him, hey, buddy, you don't have a single right on the planet Earth when it comes to my daughter. Just because she likes you a little bit doesn't mean that you get to do what you want. And so we had some conversations. And they would sort of get in my face a little bit and say, well, you know, she's 20. I said, I know how old she is, and I know how much time I've invested, and I know uh, who I am with her, and I know which, who you are, and I don't know you from Adam. You could be some kind of a serial killer for all I know. And until I know who you are, right to the core of your being, you don't have a chance. So you better get busy letting me know who you are if you want any kind of a chance with my daughter. But it just, just drive me nuts to think they thought they could just prance in there and just take over, and that was their perfect right and privilege to do so. And I would inform them, no, not on your best day, bud. So, I used to say to Patty, you know, I spent 20 years raising these kids and they got character, great character, and then this dude comes along. It shouldn't be, it should, I should be able to raise him too. I haven't had any, I don't know him from Adam. So I guess we better get busy on these dudes and uh, get them trained up good. So, the father, he's wanting a companion for his son, Jesus. So how good does this bride have to be? We're talking about Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, gave himself up for her, you know what's an interesting statement theologically? So Jesus died on the cross for who? Well, the answer is everybody. But it appears like there's sort of a circle. Gave himself up for her. Who? The church. Church began on the day of Pentecost. A lot of people before the day of Pentecost. Did he die for them? Well, sure he did, but they're not in the center circle. They're in the next circle or the next circle or the next circle. So God indeed, indeed has favorites, and it appears like even in Jesus' death on the cross, there was a priority. He gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her. Sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church 
He might present to himself the church. That's at the end of time when there's the wedding between the bride and Jesus, the bride, the church, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle, no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. He might sanctify her. So if you were to write, draw a circle in your Bible, if you uh, have a paper one, or if you printed it off like I do, saw, uh, draw a circle around that word, sanctify her, and then draw an arrow to the margin and write the word how. How? He's going to sanctify her. That's us. How's he going to do that? What's the plan? What's the strategy to sanctify her so that she might be someday presented to Jesus without spot, wrinkle, or blemish, and holy and blameless? Revelation 19, 7, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb. The marriage of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. His bride has made herself ready. And notice the words there. She has made herself ready. It's sort of like uh, looking in a mirror and having makeup and combing the hair and putting nice clothes on. Made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean the fine linen of the righteous acts of the saints. And so the wedding comes and there's the bride. She is beautiful without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. And so how did that happen when we get to that point? Number two, God has made rules or principles of growth that apply to our individual lives like laws of agriculture. I'm thinking about growing blueberries. <clears throat> John Downton's got blueberries, and, and uh, we buy them and eat them, and I think that'd be cool. I got a bunch of apple trees out there that don't get many apples on them, and they're all wormy. I think I'll take those trees out and plant some blueberries. So I've been reading about how to grow blueberries, and it's not... You know, not it's it's you got to follow some rules, some principles, uh, as far as soil and water and all that kind of stuff goes. So there's laws of agriculture. It doesn't make any difference whether you're raising blueberries or filberts. There's a right way and a wrong way to do it. There's a way to make money at it and have bumper crops, and there's a way to go broke at it. And so we just call them basic principles of agriculture. Number three, one of the primary laws is that our growth takes place primarily through and in our church. My growth takes place through you, from you. Your growth takes place from and through me, each other. That is the most significant principle recorded in every one of the epistles in the New Testament, is that our growth individually takes place in the context of the church, the bride of Christ, not outside of it. And it happens as we become interdependent uh, serving each other, edifying each other, speaking grace into each other's lives. Ephesians 4, 8, therefore it says, when he ascended on high, when Jesus rose from the dead, he led captive a host of captives. That was those that had not yet been in heaven because they couldn't go there until the resurrection. And then it goes on and says, he gave gifts to men. He gave gifts to men. He gave me a gift. Gifts gave gifts to you, spiritual gifts, that supernatural ability uh, to minister in someone else's life. And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, to the building up of the body of Christ. Years ago, I preached on this. I think that was the first series I preached when I started pastoring here at JBC, and I was on that passage, and a lady uh, I think we were still up at the grade school gym. She came up and after the service. She says, Pastor D, I knew that was your style, but I didn't know it was in the Bible. And I said, I, I, I said I don't, I'm not quite understanding what you're saying. Whipping the saints. I said, I didn't say whipping. I said equipping. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh. So I thought, well, Maybe I, I should probably think about that for a minute. <laughs> Whipping the saints. No, equipping the saints. Equipping the saints. Training. Training the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all, every one of us, attain to the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man 
Now listen to this. To the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. To the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. You know what that means? That we would be worthy of him. That we would be without spot, wrinkle, blemish. That we would be sanctified, beautiful. And uh, that's what he's doing to us. Ephesians 4, moving on to verse 15. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up. We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies. Now here's a key. According to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. The proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And so I grow in the context of the church, you grow in the context of the church, and the more every part functions properly and contributes to the health of the body, the faster we all grow. And so there's a term that's used in pastoral circles. It's called healthy church. There are healthy churches and there are unhealthy churches, and healthy churches grow because all the parts are functioning. All the parts are involved and committed, and because of their involvement and their commitment, uh, the church as a whole grows. Uh, there's a principle called the Preto Principle. It was invented by a guy way back in the Renaissance years, Reformation, Martin Luther that time. He was a, a French economist, and he came up with a rule and he stated it this way. He said, you gather all the money in the world all in one big pile and you distribute it evenly to every living person on the planet Earth. In one year, 20% of the population will control 80% of the money. Gather it all up, do it again, and the same 20% will control 80% of the money. And so that's become a well-known principle. I remember when we were on the dairy, Dad used to say 20% of our cows produce 80% of the milk. So take good care of them. And pastors say that about their churches. 20% give 80%, 20% do 80% of the work. It's just life. Um, but that's not a healthy church. Healthy church is when 100% are involved, functioning according to the giftedness that God's given them so that all the other parts are edified and built up by that giftedness that he's given them. That's a healthy church when every part functions. If you had a, or compared to a physical body, the church is, and so if you had, uh, you're inside this physical body, one eye works, one ear works, one kidney works, uh, you're missing a foot. And so I say, how healthy are you? Well, you know, I'm missing a few parts. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't call yourself healthy. Uh, that's the way a lot of churches are. In fact, you know the best illustration for a church, most churches, not ours, is to take Cliff and whack him up in about 40 pieces with a machete and put him in a wheelbarrow. And you look in the wheelbarrow, that's most churches right there, all gathered together in one place, but nothing's connected. It's just a bloody mess. Are you sleeping? I didn't get any reaction out of him. Number four, one of the greatest barriers to spiritual growth and health the greatest barriers to spiritual growth and health of a church is our proneness to independence and prideful thinking that we don't need each other. So that's the American way, and that is by far the biggest problem with most churches is that people don't understand this concept that I just gave you. And I've, I probably give that every other week in some place I'm teaching because it's such a critically important one, and it seems like even with the amount of re repeating I do of it, still people don't don't get it. Romans chapter 12, <clears throat> for through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. That is, don't think that you can grow, be healthy spiritually, bear fruit uh, on your own, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, speaking of our physical bodies, and all the members do not, have, do not have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of the other, one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them. Each of us is to exercise them accordingly. 
1 Corinthians 12, for even as the body is one, that's this physical body, yet as many members and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I'm not an ear, I'm not an eye, I'm not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, that's each one of us, each one of them in the body just as he desired. That is, he gave each of us a spiritual gift, his choice, not mine. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. <clears throat> and that proneness to say that, I can do fine without you, and to be on the outside uh, instead of involved and functioning as part of the body is the reason so many believers don't grow very much. Number five, most Christians have a low view of the church in general and a low level of commitment to their own church in particular. <clears throat> and we look at the church, we tend to see the people in it, and we all have problems, and, and uh, we all sin, and we all do things that offend each other. And so instead of looking at the church the way God does, we look at it on the surface and see simply people. And then our view of the church becomes uh, like a glorified Fred Meyer store. It exists primarily to meet my needs. And if it does, great. If it doesn't, I'll go to Walmart instead. Uh, number six, our personal spiritual disciplines, effectiveness in our own lives rises and falls on our personal commitment to our church body. Our personal spiritual disciplines, that's your Bible reading, your prayer life, those disciplines that are critically important for your walk with God. And I don't know how many times I've heard people say, you know, I have a difficult time praying for more than a couple of minutes without my mind wandering or falling asleep. I just don't seem to be able to get into it. Or I read the Bible and I don't seem to get much out of it. And that's the case with anybody who has a low level of commitment in their church family. It's a basic law of God. You cut a hand off the body, lay it over there, and it won't function. And so if we're neglecting our church family, we have a low level of commitment, a low view of the worth and value of it. We're not contributing to its health. Our Bible reading, our prayer life, all our spiritual disciplines will struggle in. It's just a basic law of God. Uh, our private disciplines rise and fall on our corporate. You worship corporately well, you'll worship privately well. You pray corporately well, you'll pray privately well. You come and listen to the Word taught, you read your Bible, and it'll make sense. Your private disciplines rise and fall on your corporate why? Because God made it that way. He makes the rules. Why? Because he wants the church tight, interdependent, united. He wants the church to function like a unit because it grows. And everything God does, he does to make the bride of Jesus beautiful. And so he's made rules just like growing blueberries and when we know and understand the principles and the rules and live by them, we grow and others grow because of our life, because of our giftedness. Number seven, another basic law of life is that the amount of grace that we receive from our church family is dependent on how much we give. So that's repeated over and over and over again in the writings of Paul. Give and it'll be given to you. Press down, shaken together, running over. That's just the way it works. You give grace and you receive grace. You give no grace and you receive no grace. Uh, and God's grace is not just applied to our salvation. We live our life by his grace. His grace is our power. 
Uh, his grace is our strength. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God, but his grace doesn't come from him to me direct. It comes through you. All of us receive grace from each other. I receive grace not to use on me, but to give to you. And all of us give grace to each other. We're interdependent. Ephesians 4.29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, only such a word as is good for edification, that is, it builds up another person according to the need of the moment, that it may give grace to those who hear. That it may give grace to those who hear. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Luke 6, 38, Given, it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, for by your standard of measure it will be measured to you in return. So God gives us tools to edify one another, and one of the major ones is in this, these 12 verses we read, Number eight, a major tool that we have in our mutual edification in each other's lives is prayer. So the cool thing about that is that I can be a key player in your life uh, much of the time and you don't even know it. So I have an iPad, and in my iPad I have an app called PrayerMate, and in my uh, PrayerMate app I have all of your names in it, and with most of you I have your pictures in it, and I, uh, there's about 2,000 names in there now, and I get through everyone's name every week, uh, mostly, probably 45 weeks of the year. Uh, some of you I spend a little bit more time on than others for two reasons. One is I don't know you, or uh, you're near perfect. <laughs> There's a few of you in that category. Uh, I, I used to jokingly say, if you want me to pray for you a lot, go out and sin big time. <laughs> uh, number nine, another key principle is that God works in our lives through other people works in our lives through other people, not directly. That is, I give grace to you, give grace to me. I didn't word that very well. And again, it's to prevent independent, self-sufficient, self-sufficiency. Number 10, I can pray for myself and my needs, but I have far more power and influence with God when I pray for you. So, I can spend an hour praying and I can spend that time on me and get a little bit of blessing or I can spend it praying on for you and what accomplished gets accomplished in my praying is so much more. And uh, then you pray for me, we pray for each other and God's made it that way. And I say, why? Because he wants us to be interdependent. He wants us to be parts that fit and recognize that he works in your life through me. He works in my life through you. That's the way he has made it. And the more we understand that, the more we function that way, the more we'll grow. Number 11, the emphasis in the New Testament is not that we would pray for each other's circumstances to improve. So if I were to think about... Uh, the average person's prayer life, and somebody were to say, what do you see as the biggest weakness or problem? It's that we think that prayer is for us to live a comfortable life. We're going to go to heaven. Some of us are going to be there fairly soon. And when we get there, we get a glorified body, and it's going to be an amazing life. This life is not designed by God to be comfortable. This life is designed to grow as rapidly as we possibly can so that the bride of Christ is without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. She is as beautiful as is possible. And so God puts us through whatever it takes in order for us to grow, and we're always praying for each other that life becomes more comfortable. Uh, God's probably not going to answer those prayers. And so if you have a problem, I rarely pray for your problem to change uh, but instead, I pray that God would grant you the strength to bear up under it, that he would work in you so that it would cause you to grow in character. You would have the wisdom to fix it if it needs fixed, that you would do that, not him, that you'd have joy in spite of it. 
So number 12, these are from Colossians 1, 1 through 12, the prayer that Paul prayed. I pray for you that you would know God's perfect will and plan for your life. That you would know God's perfect will and plan for your life. And so anybody that has any sense whatsoever knows, okay, here I'm living outside the will of God. Here I'm living in the center of the will of God. Which one is going to go better? Is that rocket science? No. You're going to do so much better in the center of the will of God as opposed to outside the will of God. And so it's not like we get an envelope in the mail every day telling us what it is. We don't see things written in the sky. We don't hear audible voices. But we can know what His will is. And so Paul prays in Colossians, I pray for you that you would know the will of God. And so I pray that for you. 13, I pray that you would choose to follow God's plan and will for your life, walking worthy of the Lord. Worthy of the Lord. Occasionally I'll hear people pray, Dear Lord, we are not worthy. And I think, or supposed to be, get on the stick. That's what Paul prays. I pray that you be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you might walk in a manner worthy of him. Worthy of him. Paul says, Lord, I thank you that you considered me worthy placing me into service. Now, it doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean we're earning our way to heaven. But it does mean that he expects us to grow in character, to become like Christ because he wants us as much like him as possible when we get there. Number 14, I pray that you will live your life in such a way as to please him in every detail of your life. God the Father from heaven spoke when Jesus came up out of the water when he was baptized. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The parable of the talents, Matthew 25, 21, the one that had five talents, the one who had two, when they stood before Jesus, he said, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 5, he said, Our ambition, whether here on the earth or whether we're in heaven, is to please him in every detail of our life. And so, when I pray for you, I pray that you will live a life in such a way as to please him in every detail of your life. 15, I pray that you would bear much fruit, that you'll do super well at the judgment seat of Christ. I like that prayer, and so I pray it a lot. When I get to uh, Tracy Rowe's name, I say, Lord, would you work in Tracy's life so that he'll just bear a boxcar full of fruit? And when he stands before you at the judgment seat of Christ, he'll hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. 16, I pray that God will give you his strength. So another thing you've heard me say regularly, but we're saying again, is that if you take all the prayer requests in the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, the prayer request that is prayed most often is the prayer for strength. The prayer for strength. So if I pray for you, that you have his strength, that you have his joy, that you have his peace, why would I need to pray for circumstances to change? Because you have joy in spite of those circumstances. You have strength to bear up under those circumstances. You have peace, even though the circumstances may be difficult. God gives peace. He gives joy. He gives strength. Circumstances are not an issue. Our greatest growth will take place in tough times when we have his strength and his joy and his peace. Our greatest fruit bearing, the difference we will make in the world, will happen in the toughest times when we have his strength and his joy and our peace and his peace in our life in spite of circumstances. 17, I pray that God will fill you with his joy in spite of circumstances and that you will not grumble about anything. So that one I can often tell if my prayers are working when I have a chat with you in the foyer. Uh, it's easy to hear people's joy level. 
in conversations. And so sometimes I make a note under your name. I need to pray a little bit more that they would rejoice always, grumble about nothing, because that's when you grow rapidly. 18, I pray that God will protect you from the evil one. So that's especially emphasized in Colossians and Ephesians. So my protection against the devil comes mostly from you interceding for me. It's not hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, when it comes to spiritual warfare, it's the army warring against the kingdom of darkness and protecting each other in the battle. And so we do that in prayer, praying for each other when we see temptation happening, when we see struggling happening. Let me read Colossians to you again, chapter 1, starting with verse 9. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you. We have not ceased to pray for you. Now, I don't think Paul was praying 24-7 for the church at Colossae, but he was praying a lot for them. And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. You'll walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, that is, your relationship with Him is becoming more intimate, strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. So that's a great prayer. And I pray that over and over and over and over again when I pray for you. Um, each of those requests so that you would grow and become mature like Christ and that we, the church, will do that for each other and we will grow together and be like him. Someday the church will be uh, wed to the, uh, to the lamb, to Jesus, and we will be his eternal companion ruling and reigning with him for all of eternity uh, in the new Jerusalem. That's going to be a great day, but uh, we, we need to grow. He's not going to fix us when we get there. What we are is what we are, and so we need to live life with a sense of urgency, with a sense of purpose, and understand that in growing, it's not an individual sport. It's a team sport. We do it together. Only together does it work. It's the church functioning as the body of Christ, each individual part uh, giving grace to the other, each individual part praying for others. The church functioning as a unified, loving whole grows rapidly. It's a healthy church. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I do pray that each of us will have a high view of your church as the eternal companion of Jesus, the bride of Christ, and that you are in the process of making her beautiful. And you do that through each of us. We all are contributors to the beauty and to the maturity of the body of Christ. And I pray that each one of us will be faithful in our part, uh, doing what you've equipped us to do, what you've gifted us to do, so that the church is made healthy because of our contribution. I pray that we would, Lord, none of us be in the uh, uninvolved, uncommitted 80%, but we would be a functioning part of the body serving and giving, and as a result, growing. Uh, work in our church, Lord, make us, uh, make us beautiful, worthy of Jesus, to please you in all that we do. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. None of 
above him, none before him, all of life in his hands. For his throne it shall remain and ever stand. And all the power, all the glory, I will trust in his name for my God. 